introduce today's seminar speaker, Anne West, uh, coming to us from Duke. So Anne was an undergrad at Cornell um, and then was an MD-PhD student at Harvard after that. And so for the PhD portion of her uh, degree, she worked with uh, Kathleen Buckley and made important contributions to our understanding of how um, cargo uh, synaptic uh, proteins are trafficked out to synapses. And then afterwards, uh, for her postdoc, uh, Anne stayed at uh, Harvard, but went over to Mike Greenberg's lab. Um, and it was at this time that I got to know her because I was lucky enough to be a young grad student one bay over from her. And so in addition to being an amazing scientist, I can also say that Anne is an amazing teacher and mentor based on firsthand experience. Um, uh, and the science that she's done uh, uh, throughout her career now has really uh, uh, stemmed from observations she made when she was a postdoc. So as a postdoc, Anne identified a new activity-regulated transcription factor uh, that goes by the name of uh, CARF. And then uh, in her own lab, which she started at Duke in 2005, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, ever since then, Anne has retained this uh, uh, real driving interest in mechanisms of activity-dependent uh, gene regulation, uh, the relevance of those mechanisms to synapse development, and also to neuropsychiatric disorders. And so um, Anne's lab has made a lot of important discoveries over the years, um, including uh, uh, further characterizing novel uh, activity-dependent pathways like the CARF pathway, but then also um, spanning into a lot of uh, new epigenetic mechanisms that contribute to activity-dependent uh, gene regulation. And her lab also has had a strong interest in um, connecting these activity-dependent pathways to uh, plasticity, not only plasticity of the developing nervous system, but also plasticity in adulthood. And so, for example, they've looked a lot at the role of um, MECP2 in uh, adults, uh, namely in responses to things like psychostimulants and antidepressants. And so I think we're going to hear about a, a bunch of these interests today. And so, Anne, mm -hmm. thanks uh, for coming and uh, taking the trip to talk to us. Well, thank you, Steve, for the really kind invitation. And thanks to all of you and, um, of course, also to the Simons Foundation for sponsoring um, this particular colloquium. I've been talking with a number of people today about, you know, the different ways in which people are thinking about understanding autism genetics and the effect of some of the genes that are implicated in autism um, in brain function. And I think getting all of us together to talk about this idea will be very um, very helpful. So I'm going to tell you today about some of the work that we've been doing on chromatin regulation in the developing brain. And when I talk about chromatin, I think you're probably all relatively uh, comfortable with this idea, but the idea is that within each cell in your body, there's actually um, a, a lot of genomic DNA. So if you stretched out all the genomic DNA in a given nucleus, it comes out to about six feet of DNA. And yet it's wrapped up very tightly into the nucleus of each individual cell, with the DNA being wrapped around cores of histone proteins and sort of this repeating structure called the nucleosome. And there's different types of folding of the DNA that's important for regulating how that DNA gets turned into different genes that are expressed within the cell. And a lot of the work that's going on um, these days is in using sequencing methodologies to look at how chromatin looks in different cell types, looking at modifications on the tails of these histone proteins, as well as opening and closing the accessibility of the chromatin at different um, spacing between these nucleosomes. And this idea that then has come along is the idea that Chromatin structure really has a lot to do with how genes are regulated. It's what makes different cells make different genes. So you can see here a diagram where we have three sort of different colored neurons and you can see a single gene that might be in close association with different distal elements, these enhancers, bound by transcription factors that are expressed in different cell types. You might have the same gene expressed by different mechanisms in different cells. And if none of these mechanisms are in association with the promoter of that gene, that gene will be off. And we know that it's both the expression of transcription factors, which are specific DNA binding proteins, as well as modifications of the histones, like different acetylation or methylation of the histones, or modifications of the DNA itself that can change the likelihood that a particular gene is turned on in a particular cell. So this is sort of the basic thing that we all understand at this point. But the interesting thing about neurons is that neurons are actually born and turned into neurons, fake committed and made not other types of cells, relatively early in the life cycle of the organism, so pretty early during development. 
And yet there's all sorts of things that have to happen, like migration, synapse formation, synaptic pruning, that have to happen long after those cells become neurons. They have to change the way that they're functioning within the brain. And in the postnatal and adult brain, you're really going to try to change neuronal function, not by changing how many neurons you have or changing that those are neurons, but in fact changing the regulation of gene expression within those cells. And so a number of years ago, my lab set out to try and ask the question, oops, I switched, I forgot there was another slide in there, to ask the question about what kinds of changes in chromatin regulation can actually occur within post-mitotic neurons. Now this became really, really important when we started to realize that in fact there were a lot of genes that are chromatin regulators um, that are actually mutated within disorders including autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability. So this is a, well, one review from a collaborative of mine a number of years ago where if you actually look at um, in the studies that were done by groups like the Simons Foundation through the Spotlight Project where they're going out and looking at individuals with autism spectrum disorder and looking for de novo variants, mutations within their genomes that look to be causative for that particular case of autism. These specific cases of rare de novo mutations, there's two major groups of genes that have been implicated. One set of them are synaptic regulators, which you might expect that disorders in synaptic function can cause autism. But the second major set, in fact, are chromatin regulators. And some of these are shown here. So we had been working for some time on MECP2 or MECP2, depending on which side of, of the uh, US you're on, or how you say it. Um, and just saying that this is an, actually a methyl DNA binding protein that I know many labs are working on here as well, which causes a particular disorder, causes Rett syndrome. But there were many other chromatin regulators that have been identified as having mutations that are associated with autism. And the question that really arises is whether or not there might be some common process or common pathophysiology that causes so many different mutations in so many different genes to give rise to this disorder. And this has been something that's been a broad interest. I'm going to tell you today about two different stories about one regulator, a lysine demethylase called KDM6B, and also a histone, an H1 linker histone called H1-4, and how we're trying to use deep dives into understanding the mutations within these proteins, their function, and how the mutations disrupt those, to try and ask this question whether there might be general processes of chromatin regulation that are important in the developing brain. So again, whoops, this thing is a little trigger happy. So again, I'm going to talk about the idea that chromatin regulation might orchestrate changes in programs of gene expression in post-mitotic neurons during postnatal periods of development, um, and that this is important for the proper timing of these post-mitotic stages of synapse maturation. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the transcription side than the synapse side, but I'll show you some of our data. And again, I'll tell you about these two different chromatin regulators. And what I'm really going to be looking for is whether we can come up with any ideas about how there might be specificity, either for the timing when these particular um, gene products are important, or the specificity in terms of regulation of the genes. So in the first part, what I'm going to tell you is this story about this lysine demethylase, KDM6B. And for this, we use the development of the mouse cerebellum as a model system for studying this process of post-mitotic neural maturation. Because the mouse cerebellum actually develops after birth, there's a layer of these, um, this uh, uh, external granule cell layer where you have a committed set of progenitors. So these are still dividing cells, they're not yet neurons. But these are going to be the granule neuron precursors, which are dividing in this, um, and, and they're expanding their numbers. They will then leave the cell cycle, turn into post-mitotic immature cerebellar granule cells, migrate past the Purkinje cells to the inner granule layer, where they'll become maturing granule cells that then exceed, receive synapses and, and send their axons out to form connections. And this happens during the couple weeks of life um, after these animals are born. Now there's a lot of cerebellar granule cells, so it's very easy to use this material for sequencing studies. And because they develop after birth, it also makes them relatively easy to use for genetic studies. So what we know is that during this time period, we see changes in gene expression that correlate with the changes in function of these cells. So here at postnatal day seven, you can see KI67 as a marker of those progenitors on the outer surface of the external granule cell layer. But already at this age, you can see the newborn neurons that are expressing double cortin, a marker that's important for the migration of these cells. And as these cells come into the inner granule layer, they turn off double cortin, but they turn on other genes like the GABA receptor alpha-6 
that mature synaptic function in order to lead to the mature function to these cells. So we can now study the chromatin regulation that's underlying these changing programs of gene expression in the postmitotic cells in cerebellar granule neurons that are differentiating in vivo. So the very first studies that we did were just to ask whether there were any changes in chromatin regulation that were happening during these post-mitotic stages of maturation. This really hadn't been asked at this time, comparing different stages of cells rather than different cell types. And what we were able to find using DNA's hypersensitivity assays at the time, DNA's one, now you would use a taxic for this kind of thing, is that we could find significant thousands of changes in the accessibility of regulatory elements occurring between each of these stages of cerebellar maturation that we compared, including between postnatal day 14 and postnatal day 60, where all of the cells are postmitotic. Now, many of these regions that become accessible, newly accessible during this time frame, are nearby genes that increase their expression. So this black line is just showing the average increase in expression and the average um, uh, as those genes change over time. And you can see these red lines are going to be the genes that are close to regions that become accessible. So regions that open up tend to be near genes that are increasing their expression. That's not too surprising. Accessible regions are bound by transcription factors. And again, if we look at these regions that become accessible, we can see that early on, these regions are not marked by this H3, histone H3, lysine 27 acetylation. This is a marker of active chromatin. But as these genes turn on, you can see the signature of this mark of active chromatin at these regulatory elements. So all of this is just consistent with the idea that you can have state, developmental state-dependent changes in the way in which chromatin is regulated, just like you can have them as fate-dependent changes during cell differentiation. But the thing that we started thinking about at that time was we could see this all happen over time. We could do it in vitro as well, and we could refine the time frame and see the opening of chromatin. But what we were really interested in is those genes that turn on late that are reflecting synaptic maturation. So an example that you all here may know is that early on in development, for instance, synapses tend to express this NR2B, or NMDA receptor 2B subunit, at the NMDA receptors at synapses, and later that B switches to A. And the switching of the subunits, a gene expression change, is important with reflecting the functional change in those synapses, their, their time courses, and also the downstream signaling. So we were really interested in those late genes and why they didn't turn on earlier, because these are already neurons, right? So what, can we, what keeps these genes that turn on late from turning on earlier? And so this is a project um, that initially was led by Fong Liu in my lab and uh, taken up by Vijay Ramesh um, and um, Melissa Minto, who is a computational biology graduate student who just defended her thesis. Um, and the later work I'll show you was done by Yaron Chan, also a recently graduated graduate student. So we were focusing on this particular residue of histone H3 called lysine 27, which gets acetylated, and that acetylation is very highly associated with active gene expression. But in fact, lysine 27 of histone H3 can be modified by many different kinds of modifications, including trimethylation. And the trimethylation of histone H3, lysine 27, is actually strongly associated with gene repression. So here you have a single site on a single histone that can be repressive or can be activated. And in fact, the reviewers of our paper asked the question, OK, these regions that become activated later, were they repressed before? So in order to answer that question, we simply went and we did CHIP-seq, so chromatin immunoprecipitation, with an antibody against H3K27 trimethylation in the developing cerebellum and did the same comparison. So we look at P7, P14, P60 in these maturing cerebellar granule cells. We can show globally there's somewhat of an, a slight increase in H3K27 trimethylation overall by Western. But now if we look locally and we compare individual sites in the genome, we can find regions that both increase and decrease the amount of H3K27 trimethylation that we ha they have. And this is even active, again, between these post-mitotic stages of neural differentiation. We have hundreds of regions across the genome that are losing this trimethyl mark. Now, interestingly and usefully, it just so happens that although H3K27 trimethylation is distributed across many regions of the genome, it's across gene bodies, it's in promoters, and it's also in intergenic regions, um, it turns out that the majority of the sites that are lost um, when the cells mature are actually gene promoters, which means that we can quickly and easily correlate the loss of that mark to the regulation of the underlying gene. So we could ask the question, okay, is this change in this chromatin mark meaningful for the regulation of transcription? 
So we can look globally with our ChIP-seq signal and just find regions that increase or decrease trimethylation rapidly or slower over time. Sorry, this is postnatal day 7, 14, and 60. And if we look at these, um, at the time course of these changes and we correlate it to the regulation of the, of the nearest gene, the gene that's right on top of it, we can actually see that the regions that increase trimethylation over time actually decrease their gene expression. And the regions that decrease trimethylation over time increase gene expression. So there's a strong correlation, as you might expect, with this repressive mark and the inverse regulation of the gene. And this is just showing you some examples here. Our classic example we like to study is this gene GRIN2C. So this is an NMDA receptor subunit, the 2C, which is like 2A. It's one of the late subunits. You can see in red here, this is the RNA expression of this gene turning on slowly over time. And then the blue, you can see this is a highly trimethylated gene in the early developing cerebellum, and that trimethylation is lost. Other genes like MYC, which is a marker of the proliferating cells, actually decreases its expression over time and gains trimethylation. And many places where there's trimethylation, the genome simply doesn't change over time, and those genes don't change their expression. So a lot is known about H3K27 trimethylation. This is a mark that's laid down by the polycomb repressive complex. For those of you working flies, this is extremely well understood that these enzymes, EZH1 and 2, are the enzymes that can add this mark to chromatin. And it's long been studied for its roles, actually, in cell fate determination and in taking cells in an early stage of differentiation and changing which kind of cell they might become downstream. So this is an example. This is just a, a review picture that, for instance, in these multipotent cells, as they become specific kinds of progenitors, and then they transition to one type or another type of differentiating cells, the idea that really came from the work that was done here by Brad Bernstein, that you might have genes that have both activating or impressive marks of their gene promoters, and they lose one or the other as they make a decision to become one cell type or the other cell type, that this was the primary function of this mark in development. But remember, we're looking at a very later stage. We're taking differentiated cells. They're already fate committed to be neurons. Not only that, they're fate committed to be granule neurons. That's all they can be, or else they die. And we're looking at the regulation then of polycomb at a much later stage as you move towards neuronal maturation. Now, why does that matter? Okay, it's the same kind of process. Well, the reason that it actually matters is because the biochemistry of histones turns out to be pretty different in post-mitotic cells than it is in dividing cells. And in particular, one of the ways that you really get rid of trimethylated K27 histones, so when they've been trimethylated like this in dividing cells, is actually just to kick them out. You replace them. You get rid of that trimethylated histone, replace it with a new histone, and then you fail to add the mark back. And this has been shown by a number of people, including Carl Spargel, during the time that um, he was in Terry Magnuson's lab at UNC. But this histone replacement slows down dramatically when cells like neurons leave the cell cycle, as shown by Ian Mays a number of years ago. And under these conditions, we actually think that the demethylases that are actually going to go in and demethylate this H3K27 site may become increasingly important. Now, we were interested in this because a number of years ago, we had identified KDM6B as an activity-regulated lysine demethylase. So we could show that expression of KDM6B was strongly induced in response to neural activity. And it was known that KDM6B is actually responsive to different kinds of signaling proteins um, as you get cells that are transitioning from state to state. So we started doing in situs, and we did our in situ again here within the postnatal day 7 cerebellum. And what do you see? But we see this very dark band of KDM6B expression right inside the outer EGL, right at the point when these GMPs have become fate committed to being, or leaving the cell cycle and becoming these immature CGNs. So this is just showing you here again, KI67 marking the dividing cells, KDM6B right inside that. As these cells leave the cell cycle, they upregulate KDM6B. So our idea was that perhaps KDM6B is actually mediating this developmental demethylation during the stage. So to ask that question, we had KDM6B floxed mice, um, and we crossed them to an 801 Cre at this stage in postnatal life. Actually, 801 will be largely uh, specific for the granule neurons. It does affect other cells as well. But within the postnatal cerebellum, it's largely going to knock out um, whatever you're knocking out within the uh, cerebellar granule cells. And then we just did ChIP-seq and RNA-seq, again, looking at H3K27 trimethylation distributions and the effect on transcription. And that's shown here. So we do see a set of a couple hundred sites that have increased trimethylation in the knockout, suggesting that KDM6B was required for removal of that mark. And if you look at that set of genes that gain H3K27 trimethylation, 
those, the expression of those genes is globally reduced relative to the wild type animals. So this is again consistent with the idea that KDM6B dependent loss of trimethylation at these sites is important for turning these genes on. And what are these genes? Again, these are the late expressed genes like GRIN2C. You can see the expression in the wild type and the conditional knockout is reduced and the K27 trimethylation is elevated in the absence of KDM6B relative to the wild type. The same thing with GRIM4, which is another kind of glutamate receptor. Oops. Okay. And we had actually already looked at more of what some of these genes were. We looked in cultured neurons and we'd done knockdown of KDM6B. And we could actually look over developmental time. I keep pressing the wrong button. I know, I know. And so we could look over developmental time. So we'd look at genes that are turning on as these cerebellar granule neurons mature in culture versus those that are turning off as they mature. And when we knocked down KDM6B, we found that in general, these genes that normally turn on late are the genes that are actually disrupted. And here's a couple of them, which are genes that have known functions at synapses. So then here was the idea. So we've got the knockout of KDM6B appears to regulate, dysregulate these upregulated genes that are normally turning on in development. And it seems to do so by the regulation of H3K27 trimethylation. So this is to be kind of suggestive that this might be important for synapses. But we really did want to look at the biology and determine what would happen to synapses in the presence or the absence of KDM6B. So to do that, again, we focused in the cerebellum on this very nice system where over time, as has been shown by people like Mary Beth Hatton, you get the development of these granule neurons, which are going to start in one place as they leave the cell cycle. They're going to migrate past the Purkinje cells, leave these axons, and over time, they're going to develop these structures um, here that are going to receive the synapses. And these structures are really interesting, large structures called claws. They're kind of like the spines of the granule neurons. And this is our indication of the maturation of these cells. So what Yaron did when he was in my lab, you can actually do um, in vivo electroporation. So he would actually go into the pups and electroporate DNA into the cerebellum. This DNA gets into the dividing um, cells that are out here, the dividing progenitors. And then as they express markers, like GFP in this case, you can then follow sparsely labeled cells as they develop in vivo. And he could three-dimensionally reconstruct the synapses of these cells. So he did this in the floxed mice, in the KDM6B floxed mice. So he knocked out KDM6B um, and looked at GFP to fill the cells, or he just filled the cells with GFP and followed them over time, looking at the length of the dendrites and also the numbers and the shapes of these claws. And the main effect that he found, you didn't see any change in the dendritic shafts and how long they were. But when he looked at the claws themselves, he saw that they normally get larger over time. And the claws of the knockout neurons were significantly smaller. He went on then also to look at the synaptic connections onto these cells. But what I wanted to ask next was really, OK, so KDM6B is required, but it's a really big gene. It's a really big molecule, right? All of these chromatin regulators have lots and lots of domains. And even though it can mediate lysine demethylation of these histones, the question was, was it, was it really required? So in order to do this, he developed a nice assay. So he had to have some way that he could rescue only the demethylase function of the, of the KDM6B enzyme. So actually what he did was he built a very small piece of the protein that just contained the enzymatic domain. You can see how large this is. He's taking a little bit of it. And he's expressing this then just as this, he HA tags it and expresses just the demethylase domain. This is showing you in 293T cells, the green cells are all expressing the demethylase domain, and the red is H3K27 trimethylation. And you can see it's completely gone when he overexpresses this domain. But he can also make a demethylase dead version. There are two amino acids that can be mutated, and it renders the enzyme completely demethylase dead. And he can prove that. He can still overexpress the construct and not see any more demethylation. So what happens if you do this now and you look at the shape of those claws and the size of them? So this is just showing you the average length of the claws here. These are the control cells that have just been transfected with GFP. If he knocks out KDM6B, those claws are significantly smaller. If he re-expresses just the demethylase domain of KDM6B, he can rescue claw size. But if he expresses a demethylase dead version of the domain, he can't rescue it. So this is our evidence that that demethylase domain is required for development of these, of these synapses. And it seems like it has to be enzymatically active. Now, that still doesn't imply necessarily that its regulation of H3K27 trimethylation is not opposed to something else that's trimethylated. That's always a challenge with these. But it certainly points to the enzymatic function of KDM6B as being important in this process.
And the reason that we thought that was interesting was because I mentioned to you the KDM6B was identified as one of these genes that has high confidence of associated with autism. So KDM6B turns out to be protected from variation in normal human, uh, across human populations. But there are 43 mutations within the gene which have been associated with autism in individuals. And five of these, these down here, are actually point mutations that occur within or nearby to the JMJC domain, the active enzymatic domain of the molecule. And just showing you here, here's, um, here's a couple of them here drawn here in red. The blue is one of these um, sites that if you mutate it, mutates the demethylase function of the, of the enzyme. And the red are some of the autism associated mutations. And you can see they're all within the binding pocket of the enzyme. So we wanted to ask whether these autism associated mutations in KDM6B actually disrupted the enzymatic function of the molecule using that assay I showed you before. So this is just now quantification. You can look at the total amount of H3K27 trimethylation in these cells when we overexpress the demethylase domain. And you can see that you can reduce that substantially. But now if you make one of these autism associated mutations within the demethylase domain itself, you no longer have that ability to reduce the, the trimethylation. So these appear to be demethylase dead. So can they rescue synapse formation? So in order to do that, we again went back to our synapse formation assay, knocked out KDM6B. And in this case, here's the data showing you before you could rescue this if you express the demethylase domain alone. But if you express this version, which has this autism associated mutation within it, you can no longer rescue the synaptic size. So this was our evidence that kind of suggested that not only was KDM6B required for development of synapses, but the enzymatic function was required. That in ASD uh, mutations, that you seem to disrupt that enzymatic function, and you could disrupt the, the development of these synapses. But of course, if you're interested in autism, you're thinking ahead a couple things. You, you want to know whether there's any autism-associated behaviors that are related with these molecular and cellular phenotypes. And you'd also probably say to me, that you know, autism-associated mutations, especially rare effect mutations like we're studying, are heterozygous in the context of humans. So you have one bad copy of the gene and one good copy. In this case, we're doing knockout and replacement. So we have only these copies here. So can we study this in a heterozygous context? Well, I don't have the whole story to tell you, but I tell you that we were very, very fortunate that right around this time, Kai Gi at the National Institute um, of DDK, whatever that stands for, diabetes and uh, something about kidneys. Yeah, I should be able to get that right. Go ahead and pipe right up. Um, was actually interested in, um, in, the, um, in these family of lysine demethylases. He'd studied KDM6A, the other family member, quite extensively. And he had actually generated a knock-in mouse where he'd made these two mutations that render KDM6B enzymatically dead within the mouse. This is really important. He actually showed that um, the KDM6B double hetero homozygous knock-in mice mimic the KDM6B knockout phenotype, which is that they die at birth. And this is due to a defect in development of a respiratory circuit that fails to mature within the brain. Again, consistent with this idea that KDM6B is important for neuronal maturation. But the heterozygous mice, um, they live and they uh, continue to survive. And so given the evidence that we had that these mutations within KDM6B associated with autism might disrupt the enzymatic function, we wondered whether or not this might be a good model for studying uh, autism-like behaviors. Now, this work is still pretty preliminary, but we did quite a bit of behavioral phenotyping in these animals, and there's a lot of things that they do not show. But the one thing that they do show is that when you look at social, um, social behavioral testing, so this is a three-chamber assay, and I'm sure you all have very strong opinions about different kinds of social testing, so I'll just tell you this is what we did. We do an assay that has three parts to it, one where we just have a mouse in a box with two different inanimate objects. We replace one of those with the social partner in order to ask about social affinity compared to affinity for an object. And then we actually go do another phase where we look at social novelty. And what happens with the KDM6B heterozygous mice compared to their wild-type littermates, and this is true for both males and females, um, we did this in both cases, is that in both cases, the wild-type mice and the heterozygous knock-ins do prefer a social object to a non-social object, but they actually don't notice that this object, whether this object is novel or not, whether the social partner is novel or not. And we actually went back and did a second experiment where we represented the familiar social partner to the mice multiple times. And the wild type mice will lose interest in the, in the familiar partner. And in fact, these KDM6B knock-in mice will not. So, um, so what I've shown you in the second part is really some evidence trying to suggest that maybe there's something here about KDM6B that's relating to regulation of synaptic genes 
that might be important for the development of synapses that could underlie things as interesting as, um, as social behaviors. Now, there's a lot left to do beyond what I've shown you here. And uh, I put this slide on here very badly that I put extra data on that I'm not going to talk about. But I'll just say there are a lot of things that we're interested in doing. We're looking to see where KDM6B is bound in the genome. We think that it's directly regulating genes, but we need to prove that yet. There are no good antibodies against KDM6B, so we're using CRISPR tagging to tag the gene in vivo so that we can do these experiments. We're very interested in what the target genes are that might underlie these synaptic phenotypes, and we have one good candidate, this gene here called PTK2B, or PEC2, which is directly associated with NMDA receptors at synapses, and we think that, therefore, this could be a direct target of KDM6B that might modify how those synapses develop and mature. And finally, we're really interested in synapse development in these heterozygous knock-in mice. Obviously, we have, in this case, some sort of social phenotype, and we know the gene mutation that we've made, but there's a lot of space in between. And we don't exactly know where we should go looking for changes in synaptic formation or gene expression that might be most relevant to that particular behavior. One of the things that we've done is collaborating with my new uh, neighbor, Dmitry Valmashev, who does a lot of single cell sequencing in the human, is we've actually looked, um, doing pseudotime analysis, at what cell types in the human actually predominantly express KDM6B. And he's shown that very early in development, there really seems to be this kind of interesting thing about what inhibitory neurons are doing, but also potentially something about the excitatory progenitors. So we're working now in using that mouse to do single cell sequencing within that model um, to see whether or not we can uh, find differences in gene expression that might explain the phenotype. Now, the thing that I really do want to talk about more, though, is the histone H3 lysine 27 trimethylation. And is this actually important, or was this just sort of some uh, other process, and how might that be important? So I'm going to come back to that, because I'm going to tell you something about the other gene that we've worked on, and then come back around to this idea. Okay, this is actually the second half of the talk. I'm well before five minutes, and it is less than half the slides. I'm just warning you, so this is good. So I mentioned that we had another gene product we were interested in. It's this histone H1.4. And this was identified a number of years ago in a group um, um, that was interested in finding uh, mutations that were associated with um, with specific forms of intellectual disability. And um, again, this work uh, that I'm going to tell you about was done by a graduate student, Martine Tremblay. She is now at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in a program on laboratory genetics and genomics. And this was a collaboration with Yang Hui Zhang, who's now at Yale, but at the time uh, was at Duke. So in this prior work, a group of people, again, working with um, uh, children who had intellectual disability and they were looking for the genes that might be mutated um, in this particular disorder, identified a syndromic form of intellectual disability called Raman syndrome. And it's characterized by a number of features, moderate, mild to severe intellectual disability, some association with autism, anxiety, vision, hypotonia, and bone abnormalities. So you can see actually some commonalities among the patients that have been identified in the facial features, which are really indicative of these bone abnormalities and, and some abnormalities in the way the teeth develop. But all of these people who have this particular um, disorder were found to have mutations within this gene called histone H1-4, and the genes, uh, the mutations seem to cluster near the C-terminus. Now, is it one of these cases just really honestly like MECB2, where you have to imagine that the people who identified this gene were scratching their heads? Because when they looked at what is histone H1, just like MECB2, it turns out a very common chromatin binding protein. The histone H1s are linker histones. They're found at the entry and exit sites of every single nucleosome. And there's a nucleosome every 147 base pairs in your genome. So there's many, 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 many copies of these within the genome. And so these histone H1s, although it's not exactly known what they do, but they're thought to sort of gate the movement of the DNA around the nucleosomes and perhaps involved with something about nucleosome sliding or compression. So they might, you know, sort of globally affect the accessibility or the repression of chromatin at a kind of a global architectural level. But really not much was known about them at all. So when it was identified then with increasing numbers of patients that all of the patients with the Raman syndrome phenotypes had this cluster of mutations here within the C-terminal domain of histone H1-4, 
and that all of these mutations were essentially frame shift mutations, and I'll show you what that does to the protein, this began to be interesting. Now, the group that we were working with actually did identify a couple of uh, mutations that look like loss of function mutations in H1-4, but they don't cause classic Raman syndrome. So there may be loss of function mutations up here in other domains of, of histone H1.4 that are associated with disease, but in fact, all these Raman syndrome mutations are out here. Now, the interesting thing about this is that all of these mutations are frame shifts, additions or deletions, that cause a shift in the protein that does two things. One, you lose the normal C-terminus of the protein, and two, you gain an abnormal C-terminal. So this C-terminal peptide sequence, the protein sequence, is identical among all of the different mutations. So this kind of strongly suggested the possibility that this abnormal C-terminal domain might be the cause of the disease, but I'm going to come back through that. So this is the idea, right? So the mutations could be loss of function. It could be you've lost that normal C-terminus and it was required for doing something. It could be gain of function. It could be that normally the C-terminus somehow um, affects like so the stability of the protein. So you have too much of the protein and it could be a simple gain of function. It could be that it's dominant negative. It could be it blocks the function of the normal protein or it could be that it's neomorphic. It could have a new function. So there was data out there on this because in fact, um, so I'll point out that the histone H1 family is huge. There are 11 different members of the histone H1 family. Four of these are germline specific, but seven of them are expressed in somatic cells. The most interested have been placed on this one called histone H1-0, which has been studied by people like Huda Zogby um, and also Adrian Bird that's for its importance and its potential regulation of MECB2. But in fact, there were these known somatic replication dependent histones that were called H1-1 to H1-5. They're located on a cluster all together in the chromosome. Um, and they turn out to change their RNA levels substantially in dividing cells. It was thought that they were replacing, making new linker histones when you were dividing cells. So they kind of been ignored um, in post-mitotic cells, but actually it was published in 1986 that they're expressed in differentiated cells. So I don't know why the replication dependent nomenclature persists. And so I'm gonna call all of these as the somatic histones. Now, many years ago in the early 90s, because people had identified the histone H1s, they thought they might be important, they started knocking them out. And the problem was not too much happened. So histone H1.0 is in a different space from the rest of them. It looked like the most important ones. They knocked it out, and there was really no phenotype in those mice at all. The individual somatic histone H1s, the H1, F2, 3, and 4, this is the one we're going to be interested in, each got knocked out, and there was no defects in development at all. So then they started knocking them out in double and triple combinations. And after a while, there were, it was possible to see some changes um, in nucleosome spacing in vivo. So that idea that maybe histone H1s were important for nucleosome spacing was important. Um, but really, again, there just wasn't that much interest. It didn't seem like loss of function was really going to tell you what the histone H1s were doing. Um, and then finally, we had done some experiments just doing overexpression of histone H1.4, and so had others. And in fact, if you overexpress or underexpress any one of the family members, you tend to compensate with the other family members. So the idea was maybe there's a lot of overlapping function, although there might be some specific functions. So now, with this idea that mutations in histone H1.4 clearly cause Raman syndrome, and the genetics is very strong, it really suggests that it's either neomorphic, that it has a new function, or it's got to be dominant negative, and it's got to disrupt the function of multiple histones so that you can actually get to the point where you can see phenotypes. So along those ideas, we said, OK, well, we would like to study the function of histone H1.4 mutants, and it's involved in intellectual disability, so we think we'd like to study it in neurons. And if it's dominant negative or neomorphic, then we could just overexpress it in those neurons, and that would be a way to study what happens when you have that mutation. But in fact, we have to know if it's expressed in neurons first. And the problem is that because histone H1.4 is a member of this large family and they're very, very similar, there's no antibodies that differentiate them from one another. So how are we going to know if it really is expressed in neurons? So we've taken two approaches to this question to demonstrate this. The first one is we collaborated um, together with Nick Young uh, at Baylor um, to do mass spec. So he does top-down mass spec and he focuses on histone H1s. 
So what we've actually done is we've purified now um, uh, cerebellar granule cell neurons so that we know that we're only working with neurons. We take this marker called, uh, this is the intact mouse, it expresses a nuclear envelope protein tagged with GFP um, in a Cree-dependent manner in a specific population of cells. So again, we're labeling the granule neurons in the cerebellum. We can then immunoprecipitate the nuclei of these cells, and this is just showing you here. So we've got purified cerebellar granule cell nuclei, all of which are labeled with this GFP. We took these then out from mice at different ages, from postnatal day 7, 14, 21, and 60, I think. Uh, here we go, 7, 14, 21, and 60, and we collaborated together with Nick in order to look at the expression of all the different histone H1 variants that were found within those cells. And so here he's able to do this by mass spectrometry to demonstrate which ones are expressed. And what we've showed were things that had been expected. So for instance, here's histone H1.4, and you can see that over time, the percentage of the histone H1s that are within these neurons generally over time increases to be expressing H1.4. So H1.4 of all the histones in this cluster is the one that's most strongly associated with neural maturation. And this right here, just to point out, this is a phosphorylation site on the C-terminal tail of H1.4. Just like all the other histones, the histone H1s are post-translationally modified, although the functions are less well understood. But this phosphorylation site was known to be involved with cell proliferation. And in fact, only at postnatal day seven in the cerebellum do we have proliferating cells. So the presence of that mark at postnatal day seven and the loss over time is again consistent with the fact that we have now stage-specific isolation of one specific cell type where we can follow the distribution of the histone H1s over time. Now, the second way that we've then gone and looked at histone H1.4 in the brain, this is, you know, very time consuming and we're comparing histone H1s to H1s, but we'd like to be able to do things more broadly. So we actually went and we knocked a tag into the endogenous histone H1 gene using CRISPR so that we could actually put a flag and MIC tag at the beginning of that gene and we can follow expression of endogenous histone H1 now with this antibody over time. And this is just showing you here a bunch of different uh, tissues at the, where we can see a band in the tagged and no band in the wild type, demonstrating that we've actually tagged the endogenous gene. We can then follow expression over time. So it had been well known that histone H1-0, which is actually at a different molecular weight, and those antibodies are quite much more specific. We could see that increase in expression over developmental time here in the cerebellum. And now we can do this with the anti-flag antibody to look at histone H1.4. In cerebellum, of course, it got quite a bit of expression in the dividing cells of postnatal day seven. But you can see in other brain regions where all of the cells are post-mitotic, again, we get an accumulation of H1.4 as those cells continue to mature well after they're out of the cell cycle. So again, consistent with the idea that H1.4 appears to be particularly highly expressed in maturing post-mitotic neurons. And these are the pictures that I threw in at the last second this morning and why I had the lights turned down, because we've now got images where we can actually look at expression of histone H1.4 within sections of the brain. And I probably need to make these brighter, but I'll point out this is the cerebellum. The very dense layer of cells are the granule neurons, and you can see the green is going to be the MIC tag in histone H1.4. So you've got a lot of expression. This is in postnatal day 60, so the adult mouse. A lot of expression of histone H1.4 here in these mature granule cells. Interestingly, you have the Purkinje cells right at this other layer. So this is calbindin right here, marking the Purkinje cells. These are the cell bodies and the dendrites going up into the molecular layer of the cerebellum. And Purkinje cells are fascinating because they've got these giant, huge nuclei. They're huge. They're much, much larger than the granule cells. And those nuclei really do not appear to be labeled with histone H1.4. So every time that we have looked, we've actually been looking and we see really holes where the Purkinje cells are. So this is really interesting because histone H1.4, we tend to think of any of the histones as being relatively broadly and generally expressed. But we do seem to have some evidence of cell specificity. We can also see stage specificity. So this is the, this is the adult dentate gyrus. Again, you can see this very dense layer of cells that are stained here with the DAPI. And here is the mixed staining that you can see. And on the inner face of the dentate gyrus, there really appears to be substantially more expression of histone H1.4 than there is on the outer face. So this looks like, again, we can see changing levels of expression of H1.4 in the newborn neurons versus the neurons that were born previously.
So we're continuing to work with this mouse in order to study, for instance, if there is cell type specific or stage specific effects of H1.4. And we're working on building the mutations into H1.4 as well. Um, but certainly we can definitely say using this mouse that histone H1.4 is expressed in those post-mitotic neurons. So now we can ask the question, if we overexpress the RM and S mutants, the Raman syndrome mutants, what happens to the cells? So we actually did this in rat hippocampal neurons, and we actually overexpressed either wild type or mutant H1.4. They're both stably expressed and targeted to the nucleus. Here in the red is the MIC tagging of the overexpressed construct. But we did see this really interesting difference. We now have this in iPS cells too. I didn't show you more pictures, but we can see this in, in human cells as well, that the endogenous, the wild type H1.4 is sort of generally spread through the nucleus, whereas the mutant H1.4 accumulates near the edges of the nucleus. And um, we actually quantified that here. I'll point out that this had been seen in another paper. This was actually somebody else's paper where they actually had a cell line that was derived from a person with a specific um, uh, endogenous mutation. These are IPS cells derived from that person. And you can actually see, again, the expression of the mutant H1.4 around the edges of the nucleus. Um, so we do think that this is a fundamental difference. Something about how H1.4 functions in the nucleus or what it does to chromatin um, is different with the mutant than the wild type. Now, when we looked at gene expression then, given that we had an effect on the nucleus, we looked at gene expression, um, we could see that if we just overexpress wild type H1.4 and compared it to GFP expressing neurons, we saw very little happening within those cells. This is, again, what I'm saying to you. There's compensation within the family. When we looked at other members of the histone H1 family, we saw down regulation of those members, suggesting they were compensating for the increased expression we had of histone H1.4 here. But now, if we compared overexpression of the mutant, of the mutant that causes Raman syndrome, the C-terminal frame shift, to the wild type, now we saw many genes that were increased or decreased in their expression, suggesting we were getting a pretty broad alteration in transcriptional regulation in these cells. We took all these genes, and of course, you do as you do, and you do go analysis, and you ask what categories they're in. And in fact, they were in some very interesting neuronal categories, including the expression of synaptic genes and neuropeptide receptors that were significantly lower um, in the expression in the cells that were expressing the Raman syndrome mutant compared to the wild type. So this is consistent with an interruption of the neuronal maturation of these cells. We didn't change them from neurons and other cell types, but we did seem to affect the, um, disrupt the expression of genes that were important for the synaptic functions. When we then took these cells and we put them on extracellular electrode arrays, we could then record the activity of cells within a culture that were overexpressing either the wild type or the mutant H1.4. You can see action potentials in both cases that don't look too different, um, extracellular recordings of these cells when you look at them. But in fact, if you look overall at how many cells were firing and how synchronous the firing was between cells within the wild type and the overexpression of the mutant case, you can see a significant reduction in the total firing rate of the cells as well as in the synchrony of those cells. So taken together, all these data do suggest that in this particular case, that expression of this mutant histone in post-mitotic neurons is sufficient to disrupt gene expression during development and the function of those cells. But of course, there's still this question of the biochemical mechanism, right? We've now changed a histone, um, and that histone is found at pretty much every nucleosome across the entire genome. And in all these cases, it really raises this question of whether or not there's any specificity of this process. And how do you even get at that question? So in the very last few slides, I'm going to present to you absolute, utter, and total speculation about what I think might be going on and where we're going next. And that's because there was a very nice series of papers that were published in last, uh, last fall, I think it was fall 2021, um, by the same groups that had knocked out the histone H1s originally. And they knocked out a couple of them, and they knocked them out in very specific cell types. And they looked at chromatin in a new and kind of different way. So what this particular group did was they were looking at these germinal center B cells, which are actually cells that are dividing extremely quickly. So they're, in, uh, they're, they're actually increasing in response to um, some sort of stimulus. And they knocked out both H1.2 and H1.4. And they did this in part because H1.2 turns out to have some mutations also in it that are associated with various forms of B cell cancers. 
So in this particular case, they were wondering what these two histones might be doing within these cells. And what they did was they used chromatin confirmation assays, now not just to look at an individual locus and how that locus might be changing in response to the loss of this histone, but they looked globally at what happens to chromatin architecture. And you may know that globally, the chromatin in, neuro, in nuclei is kind of divided into two parts. There's the B domains which are largely compressed, highly compressed regions, where most genes are turned off. And then there's these A domains, which tend to be more accessible and active and turned on. And so you do see genes clustering in this way, that you can identify regions that are more repressed and regions that are more active. And when they compared the wild type to the double knockout B cells, they found that there were shifts in the percentage of these different compartments if they looked at different parts of the genome. And in general, what they found overall was that in the absence of these two histone H1s, you saw a general shift from the more compressed to the more open regions of the, of, the, of the chromatin. There were a couple cases where they went in the opposite direction, as these things always do. But in general, they see some sort of decondensation of chromatin. And what they did after that was they then layered these histone modifications on top of this. And what they're trying to get at is a little bit of what the mechanism might be, right? Because when you start looking at modifications of the histone proteins, what you're really looking at are docking sites for different kinds of regulatory proteins that might be involved in setting up this overall kind of structure. And what they saw if you looked at the regions which are actually highly labeled by H3K27 trimethylation, my favorite chromatin modification here, what they found was that these high H3K27 trimethylated regions can be found in the regions of repressed chromatin and the regions of activated chromatin, although they're largely over here in these repressed domains. And in the double mutant, they shift to the right. So those H3K27 trimethylated regions, the regions where that mark is presumably supposedly important for repressing genes, seems to become somewhat more accessible, maybe making those regions more sensitive to their dysregulation. Now, that's interesting because there was another model that was out there in the background. So what does H3K27 trimethylation do? It is a repressor that turns genes off. It causes recruitment of PRC1, puts genes into polycomb bodies, and leads to permanent repression, right? This is what we learn in the textbooks. But a couple of years ago, there were a couple of papers published which actually proposed an alternative model. And for certain genes, it turns out that H3K27 trimethylation is really just a binding site for a bunch of regulatory proteins. And then in certain cases, it seems like these regulatory proteins hold enhancer-promoter interactions together such that later, when an activation signal comes along, these genes can be turned on. And this was shown in anterior neural development, um, in very early stages of neural development, and it was also shown in some other kinds of neurons that this mechanism could exist at specific genes. So it's possible there's really two classes of H3K27 trimethylregulated genes. One class which are totally repressed. They're in inactive chromatin, where this mark really isn't all that important for their regulation during development because it's just keeping those genes off. And another class where H3K27 trimethylation might be more labile, where its regulation by genes like KDM6B might be really important for the timing of those genes, for their ability to turn on, for poising them in response to different kinds of stimuli. And so this is just really the final slide. Here's the idea. This is based on a model that's out there. Sort of looking at, if you think about chromatin at all these different levels of analysis, if we start where we did originally, where we're just looking, doing chip seek, and just looking across the linear domain of the chromatin, where's a mark like H3K27 trimethylation? We think about how that plays a role in enhancer-promoter interactions, the next level up. How those enhancer-promoter interactions are clustered then into these regions like A and B, these more active or more repressed domains. And that maybe there's these regions, you know, this idea that within A and B domains, there might be these regions where polycomb is really important for fully repressing genes. But we're simply adding this idea that maybe there's another region that's within these active regions where K27 trimethyl is more dynamic where it's more possible to be regulated. And maybe these actually form domains within the nucleus where something like just the enzymatic domain of KDM6B might be able to activate these genes simply by demethylating them because they're actually in an active chromatin environment. Now, as I said, I don't really have the data to show you on this idea yet, but what we've been doing is working together with colleagues for using increasingly sensitive methods for doing 3D chromatin confirmation that require very few cells.
where we can go in and take cells with different states where we've knocked out different regulators like these two that I'm telling you here, where we've manipulated the levels of H3K27 trimethylation by using drugs that block the enzymes that change that mark and asking about the effects on these different levels of chromatin regulation, both about the distance, um, the, the ability to have regions be accessible as well as regions be um, coupled together in enhancer promoter loops and also into these higher level chromatin confirmations. So that's pretty much the whole thing. Um, these are all the people in the lab who did this work. I sort of told you some of the main ones as we went along. Yaron Chan left me to go to McKinsey and make a lot of money, but I hope he'll come back and fund the lab in the future. Um, this is him here, and he uh, took us out for a wonderful party when he graduated and defended his thesis. Um, Melissa Minto also recently defended her thesis. Um, she did a lot of the computational work that's behind the bioinformatics I showed you. Martine Tremblay also recently defended her thesis, and she's now up at Mount Sinai, and she did all the work on the histone H1s. VJ Ramesh is a highly sought after newly graduating, going to be a postdoc, definitely interested in coming and working in a place like Boston. Um, he's already been, uh, he's, he's not allowed to leave though until he finishes the chromatin confirmation data. And we're very grateful to our funders um, from both NIH and the Ruth K. Broad Biomedical Research Foundation, which has really helped us start to work in human cells. So thank you all, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I mean. Have you done RNA seq to see whether your specific set of synaptic genes are upregulating or just upregulating everything? It just so happens that that boosts the load gene. That experiment is going to the you know to sequence very very shortly. So we had to build constructs that would allow us to knock down and rescue, and so. We did that. We actually built all the rescue constructs that we could use within cultured cells. Um, it's, what we were doing in vivo, what we're showing you in vivo, is doing electroporation. It's very sparse. So we can actually see within the, within the, um, uh, the neurons that are labeled. But it's, it, it's not a, an easy experiment for doing RNA-seq from that. So we had to revise all this in a system where we can do it in culture, which is what we did. Um, and those are going to sequence now. I think the really interesting question is, if we did chip seek for these demethylase domains alone, are they actually localizing? Like, where's the information that's localizing them? I don't know whether they are localizing, but we're also actually, again, in, in the hopper, sending to sequence very shortly, is we're just overexpressing those demethylase domains, and then we're doing the H3K27 trimethylation chip seek. So we want to know, are some regions, I, what I'm suggesting to you here is, you know, some regions may be more um, available for being demethylated. That may actually be a physical compartment within the cell. So it may not be the localization of the enzyme as much as it's just something about this region makes it more accessible for demethylation. Demethylation is a pretty unfavorable process, actually, as you may know. Um, and there was a lot of, it's, it's still very challenging to prove that any of these lysine demethylases really function in their regulation of genes by demethylating histones. The evidence, whether that's true or not, has been pretty, pretty hard to come by. So, so we're still, I mean, the alternative possibility is that demethylase domain binds to something else and that it's recruiting that other thing to those regions and activating them. So these are the questions that we're really actively working on looking at. I wish I had more answers for you, but we will soon. Right. So the way that we've done the experiments where you've seen the synapse data, those are actually done where we electroporate into the brain and we're doing knockout and, and replacement at the same time. So we're electroporating into cerebellum. So they're going to be electroporated into the progenitors, the cerebellar granulinorum progenitors, which quickly leave the cell cycle. So we think that these constructs, I mean, if we look at when the constructs are expressed, we see them expressed in both the inner, um, the, the inner layer of the outer granule cell layer as well as the inner granule cell layer. So we think that over the time, when you do the knockout and the re-expression, they're probably post-mitotic, but they're still pretty early. So we look over the course of, you know, the, when we're doing the synapse assays, these are experiments we're doing over the course of about 10 days. Um, so we haven't actually done this um, where we're looking out farther, doing it um, in the adult animals. It would be possible to do that in adult animals. We just haven't done it there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so let me try and, um, I didn't exactly get all the pieces of it, but I think you're, um, you're trying to say, so let me try this again. Try it again. Try. Yeah. Yes. Um, found first in science, you mean expressed first or that they were identified as the, okay, so, um, so is there a reason that they were, so I think it's the fact that chromatin regulators regulate sets of genes that cause them to be um, associated with disorders like autism. I mean, I have a feeling that if you knock out, if you make a heterozygous mutation of any single gene product within a cell, that my guess is that many of those don't cause phenotypes because it's one gene product. Like transcription factors, the argument that would say that maybe transcription factors aren't all that interesting, actually one could argue, would be because they regulate so many downstream genes that no matter what you do to them, you're likely to see some sort of aberrant phenotype. And in fact, maybe all of these mutations in every chromatin regulator that's associated with autism regulates a distinct set of downstream genes and just you're messing up the cell and if you mess up the cell, blah, you get autism, something like that. That remains a possibility, right? So it, it, is, it behooves the people studying them to try and find points of convergence. Are there points of specificity? So just because a transcriptional regulator can regulate a set of genes, it doesn't mean that that set of genes is necessarily required for the phenotype or you know, that rescuing those genes would necessarily alter the phenotype. So we are thinking more about a process than a specific gene. So for example, the process we've been thinking about is the time when late genes turn on. So many of these genes, like RIN2C or GABA receptor alpha-6, are synaptic genes that alter the way those synapses function. And if you change the composition of an NMDA receptor, for instance, you can have a cellular effect like closing out the critical period in a different kind of way. So here's a case where all of those synaptic genes that normally turn on late, if they all turn on early, too early, or too late, that may alter some fundamental process within the brain, is the idea. Now, whether one can prove that's true, that's what we have to try to do. My hypothesis right now is maybe they're co-localized within the nucleus in some particular compartment, which is something that we can go looking for. I wonder if um, overexpressing a set of genes yes. um, at the same time, prematurely or very late, right. would sort of help with confirming the hypothesis. Yeah, you know, no, it, 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 it's such a good question. I can't tell you how many years I've been in this field where we identify programs of gene expression and you know what the next experiment is that everybody does? They knock out one of them or they rescue one of them. I don't even think in the worms. Do you ever knock out 100 genes at the same time? No, of course. See, so um, actually transcription factors are a great way to sort of to, to address that because if you have a transcription factor, you can modify its function and you can globally upregulate a set of genes or globally downregulate them. That might be a way to address this question. Things like FOS, so activity regulated genes that once they're induced will go and bind with other transcription factors to modify the expression of their targets. This is an example of something you know, that, that might be a global you know, sort of tuner of total transcription, right? It's the right kind of thing to go after that. But um, we don't tend to do experiments that way, just because it's hard. So, but I think you're right. I mean, that's probably the way the, the biology works. The blinker histones, this extra C-terminus, the kind yeah. of thing that goes on H1.4, now that you have that overexpression assay, just thinking about like the mechanism that gives rise to those phenotypes, can you like, take the other blinker histones and add that C-terminus onto that? Well, that's they're a good so question. similar and see. Whether it's just like creating that docking domain on this stuff that yep. fucks things up, or yeah, yeah. if there's something more specific to the different linker. Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, there's a there's been some really cool papers written. Uh, Danny Reinberg is one people's written. He's looking at you know, sort of summarizing the data on the different linker histones and whether they have specific or general functions. And there is some evidence that the different linker histones are, as we've shown, certainly differentially expressed over time, as, um, so that's one way in which they're different, um, as well as they may bind to different regions of the genome, although again, you have to go back to, you have to tag it and chip it in order to know the answer to that question, because none of the antibodies are specific for individual members of the family.
So, um, so yeah, these are experiments we're proposing to do. We're actually knocking uh, t you know, tags in that will allow us to do protein-protein interactions with that C-terminal tail. Um, and as part of those, we can actually knock those into any one of the linker histones, actually. I didn't really think about that, but we could knock them into, into H1.2 as well as H1.4 um, and see whether or not we could see differential effects. My guess is that it's the tail, not the histone, the, only that the gene just controls you know, when and where the histone is expressed more than anything else, but I don't know. Yeah? Um, you mentioned in the slide, for example, there are two types of uh, H3K tag genes, one that is completely repressed and the others that can, you know, are sort of primed for expression of activation. <coughs> Do you, what do you think, how does the system distinguish between these two? Is there a difference in the tag itself? Is it just where it's situated on the, on the chromatin or, you know, exposure to some sort of uh, right. alien region? You know, one of the ideas is certainly that um, in this, and this was actually shown in some of this earlier work here, is that, you know, when you look at these, um, at this gene repression, you get the synergistic repression between the PRC2 and the PRC1 complex. So the PRC1 complex um, actually contains these ubiquitinating enzymes. And so you're going to recruit, you, you basically get this, um, uh, each of these factors feed forward, recruits the other. And so you get this state in which essentially the chromatin can be completely repressed. Presumably in this kind of case, you'd have to have some state where you don't get that feed forward process. Whether that's because there's some uh, you know, resistance to recruiting PRC1, could this be a neighborhood of the nucleus that just doesn't really let PRC1 get in that region? Um, you know, could it be something about the relative amount of activation? So if the regions surrounding were acetylated, for instance, with histone acetylation, could that be a buffer against um, really spreading repression that was being uh, recruited by these, by these repressive molecules? But I think these are questions we don't know the answer to. But certainly you can knock out the enzymes and you can see what happens in different regions. We're also working with dead Cas9 versions of these enzymes where we can recruit them locally onto the chromatin and then see the local consequences for what happens to other kinds of marks at those sites. Okay. Thank you.